It is my honor and pleasure to welcome a panel of unparalleled distinction, comprising Prime Minister Honorable Mia Amor Motley of Barbados, Honorable Dennis Charles, representing Prime Minister Ruth Kerrit of Dominica, who is also the incoming chairman of the OECS, and who was regrettably unable to today. Ms. Tassin Syed of the World Bank, Ms. Aubrey Richards of the Jamaica Venture Capital Program, Ms. Sadi Jemot, BIT General Counsel, and my colleagues, Mrs. Jacqueline Emmanuel Flood, our Director of Economic Affairs and Regional Integration, and Lisa Stone, Head of Development Corporation and Resource Mobilization, as well as all of you, our esteemed participants who are logged into this webinar. We are at a peculiar moment in this time of COVID when we have not only experienced the debilitating effects of lockdown, but also the compounded lassitude of webinar overload. That over 1,600 of you from all continents of the world have chosen to be with us today speaks to the expectation that this webinar itself will not be the usual online fair. We expect to receive unique insights from leaders who have earned their stripes in the successive battles against vulnerabilities of size, climate, political economy, and now pestilence of almost biblical proportions. Well before there was any indication of a pandemic, the OECS Commission conceived the idea of a major trigger event that would bring synergy to the work of the Commission and advance its mental mandate. We needed a forum that was different from the traditional donors' cons. We needed a dynamic process that would bring a wide universe of stakeholders from all sectors, private and public, investors and entrepreneurs who think differently, demographics, to challenge a mind. That was how the idea of the sustainable development movement was born. We called it a movement because although the high point is a summit in September 2020, a series of events preceding would have created the momentum to excite and engage constituencies to create that paradigm shift. COVID has, in fact, opened even more radical opportunities for a transformational agenda. The dialogues and imaginings that precede the September summit are aligned to the sustainable development goals, but framed in the core ambition of our revival Baste. Today's webinar on Business Unusual is focused on the of SGG 9 that speaks to industry innovation and infrastructure. An a powered teaser and leader of SDM 2020, where we will be unpacking innovative solutions in that sphere. So before I hand over to our moderator, Mrs. Marshall Lewis of FCI Inc. and one of our leading human capital experts in the region, please enjoy this preview of the SDM 2020. And in the many languages of this special gathering, I say, welcome. Benvenu, Benvenos, Haini, Dobro, Pajalovat, Alambika. Yo Kosha, welcome. Get ready for the ultimate summit for 2020, the inaugural OECS Republic Bank Sustainable Development Movement, September 23 to 24, at the Royalton Resort and Spa, St. Lucia. Join over 3,000 delegates, virtually or in person, and be a part of the discussion on innovative sustainable development, featuring keynote speakers Damon John, Les Brown, Dr. Didicus Jules, Marlene Street Forest, Shinedu Echeru, Melanie Harwood, plus other global leaders and development partners. A pitch room for innovators and entrepreneurs, panel and round table discussions with strategists, and a modern showcase of exhibitors from around the world. The SDM 2020 Summit. Two days, intense conversations. Join the movement September 23 to 24 at the Royalton Resort and Spa, St. Lucia, or online at OECSSDM.com. It's not just a conference, it's a movement presented by the OECS, Republic Bank, and other global partners. Register now. Good morning, everyone. Before we move further, 
what I'd like to do is take a quick poll. And what we want to do in light of COVID and all the challenges with travel restrictions is a quick poll to just ensure that we are better able to understand not only your availability, but the best mode via which we can share uh, what we have planned in September with you. So with that being said, I'm just gonna do a quick poll and ask our participants to kindly um, take, the, take a minute to participate. So the poll should be up now. Thank you, I see that you are busily giving us feedback. We're just gonna have that poll up for 60 seconds before we move into our keynote speaker, the Honorable Prime Minister, Miramar Motley. All right, so we are going to take this poll just again at the end of the session for those of you who may not have been able to participate. So thank you very much. Moving along. Allow me to introduce you now to some of the, a quick introduction into the speakers. Bear with me, it seems that my screen is sticking a bit. What we refer to as Murphy's Law today, but we're gonna rebuke that and move forward. So let's of course first start with our keynote speaker, the Honorable Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados and indeed Chair of CARICOM. Um, PM Motley of course is no stranger in terms of speaking to um, on this topic that she'll be addressing us on. Uh, PM Motley, QC and MP became Barbados's eighth and first female Prime Minister on May 25th, 2018. Ms. Motley was elected to Parliament of Barbados in September 1994 as part of the new Barbados Labour Party. She is indeed an attorney at law with a degree from London School of Economics, specialising in advocacy, and is also a barrister of the Bar of England and Wales. And a lot of you may know that Ms. Motley has accomplished many firsts in her esteemed career. And it is indeed a pleasure to have her share her time with us time with us this morning. And um, as we mentioned, Ms. Motley is indeed our keynote speaker and you will hear from her shortly. Also joining us from the World Bank is Tassine Saheed. Tassine is the country director for Caribbean countries at the World Bank. She's a seasoned development professional with over 20 years of operational leadership and experience in the bank, working intimately in terms of working with uh, the key experts in the countries within which she serves in the Caribbean to develop their respective agenda. Audrey Richards is a consultant with the Development Bank of Jamaica with responsibility for development of the ecosystem for private equity and venture capital in Jamaica. She also is tasked with a number of key projects aimed at the development of local early stage and entrepreneurship ecosystems. Next, we have Ms. Jacqueline Emmanuel Flood. Jacqueline continues to have quite a bit of impact in St. Lucia, her home country. She's currently on the board of directors for CARICOM Development Fund and also serves as the director of economic affairs and regional integration at the organization of Eastern Caribbean states, of course, the OECS commission. Hailing from Barbados, we have Shadi Jemot. Shadi is a qualified attorney at law and certified trust and estate practitioner. Prior to assuming her current role, she was general counsel and company, which is, sorry, general counsel and company secretary at BIT. She specialized in international business as the pan-Caribbean law firm Lex Caribbean. And then last, but by no means least, the Honorable Denise Charles is the Minister of Tourism, International Transport and Maritime Initiatives for the Commonwealth of Dominica. Prior to her ministerial appointment, Minister Charles was the general manager of PDV, Carib 
Dominica, an energy company which not only delivers energy solutions for both individuals and companies, but is also she was also instrumental in supporting various social welfare programs for the Commonwealth of Dominica. This would be the flow of the presenters. I would have introduced them in the manner and the order in which they would be presenting. Panelists, a warm welcome to each of you. And what I'm going to do is ask our panelists to, of course, remain online, but if they can kindly remain muted until their time to speak, and also if they can take their videos off, just so that we ensure that we are making the most use of the bandwidth. Thank you. And now it is my definite pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, the Honorable Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, and as mentioned, Chair of CARICOM. And Minister Motley would be answering our first question, which is on the screen right now and looks primarily at the impact of COVID-19 in regards to the global economy and the vulnerabilities that has exposed us to as small island states. Specifically, we've asked Pierre Motley to address how she sees small island states taking leadership, as well as what will that new Caribbean outlook be? Prime Minister Motley, indeed a pleasure. Over to you. Um, let's ensure that Pierre Motley is unmuted, please. Pardon me, Minister Motley, we're just checking the mic. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you very much. Everything is business unusual today. So <laughs> that um, we have to we have to know how to flex and roll and move. I want to thank you for the opportunity for giving me a chance to get away from the the schedule that I had this morning. I thank Didicus for that. And to say that the only thing I would have much rather be in the Eastern Caribbean now at this point to speak to you. But having said all of that, it is what it is. And you ask, how will we take leadership in this post COVID-19 um, arena? The truth is that the Caribbean has an obligation to continue to be the voice of conscience for the world. Um, I've said over and over, that for too many countries and for too many people, we have become invisible and regrettably for some even dispensable. And our experiences in terms of keeping us focused on the center of humanity, the center of taking care of people. And the irony is COVID has laid bare, as we've all said, all of the cracks and all of the warts that existed before. And in small island states with limited capacity, especially with us as the most travel and trade dependent region of the world, we've seen all of that come, come to play. We've also seen the, the importance of us having a global international framework that is going to allow us to be able to bring some sense of equilibrium and some sense of moral leadership to what is taking place um, generally, not just with COVID, but across the world, whether it was the climate crisis, whether it is within the context of um, high debt, low growth, whether it's in the context of us fighting violence, whether it's in the context of us fighting the public health problems. It is hard to predict where the weakest links in the chain will be before crisis. And often they turn out differently than we envisage. I'm sure that few of us envisaged that there would be so much oil that you could not get paid to buy it, or that you could close off an economy overnight. Zero revenue for tourism, never, never, never crossed our minds. So when you get a crisis like this one, we have to observe critically what did not turn out to be a problem and what did turn out to be a problem for us. And I just mentioned market failure. I mentioned inability to get access to critical in vitro diagnostics, be it tests, be it swabs, be it extraction kits, be it ventilators. Um, we now know what it is in true terms in the third decade of the 21st century to be at the bottom of the totem pole. And we have to learn everything that we can now and to recognize that with this lockdown, that there is a lot we can learn. And, and let me give you three examples of what we have learned. One, there's a third security 
food security, energy security, and health security. Global food and energy supply chains held up better than expected this time around. Maybe not the next time. And, and believe you me, we are planning for it regionally and nationally. But the emergency medical supply chains, as I said, and the protocols did not, did not stand up. And this continues to be a particular problem for small states, so that we have to take leadership on these international treaties and definitional issues and cross-border movement of emergency medical equipment. The question is, is there now a need with the vacuum in global leadership on this issue? Is there now a need to develop some kind of international compact that guarantees access especially to small states or, or, or people who, for whatever reason, fall through the crack, guarantees them access to public health, um, critical public health supplies. And, and the fact that the World Bank uses the, 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 the theme of solidarity tells us that this is where we need to be going. I, I want to go on because the truth is that we have literally to pause and ask ourselves, what is happening with respect to the other areas white people's voices are so quiet. And we are 15 states in the region, 15 states, and we have to use that voice definitively. Today is the voting of Security Council. And we've had countries running and meeting with us as much as we can, um, but we have not been able to extract as a single unit the kind of help and assistance that will give the region that competitive advantage to go forward. Because we don't act as one. We act in a divided way, and therefore we are not responded to as a single global force of 15 states. Not to mention if we were to go as wide as the, uh, the Alliance of Small States, which carries us to 40-something states. Secondly, we need to protect the health of our visitors as well as our nationals. And I've said this over and over, it is a vital song that we need to sing. There is no doubt that we are going to have to live with COVID, but whatever we do must first and foremost ensure that we protect the health of our people, and then of course the health of those who choose to be our people for a limited period of time when they visit. Um, the region needs to exploit its good track record in public health during this crisis. I've spoken over and over about how Barbados's legacy to the Caribbean and to the rest of the world in the 20th century in the area of health was to produce a series of public health giants, Sir Kenneth Standard, Sir Kenneth Stewart, Sir George Allen, and we can go on and on with the numbers of persons who made a difference, not just at the regional level, but at the global level. This narrative will help support our tourism in general. Um, we don't expect ads to be the only means of communicating to people overseas. We need to do it through normal news media, normal stories, journals, magazines. And in those stories, give the, the world the history of Caribbean's interaction with public health, and in therefore why we more than any other region are well placed in terms of health, tourism, and retirement villages to be able to provide opportunities for people who want somewhere to look. I've already spoken over and over that many of our countries are underpopulated, and we have to be able to come to grips with that. In our own case in Barbados, I established a National Population Commission, and that National Population Commission has allowed us to be able to recognize that since 1980, our population has been declining. We've not replaced it. So that if we had simply replaced our population from 1980, we would be at another 80,000 people in terms of our population, which would make a phenomenal difference to the macroeconomic stability of our nation because of the level of production and output. Um, the, the question of insurance for those visiting our nations, we need to be able to do some work to determine whether there is in fact a framework or a business opportunity for health insurance for the tourists coming to the Caribbean. Um, in effect, we are now, as we take them, as we seek to open up our borders, we will become the health insurer of last resort for the visitors. Um, and, and, and we need to settle how that could work. Um, it is possible that 50% of the premium would go partly to insure against the cost of enforced stays and the balance to help to fund the maintenance of our public health redundancy that we have now and to underscore our commitment to care for all of those on the island in a public health disaster. Imagine if every tourist had the offer 
a $1 premium per day per stay throughout the entire Caribbean. How much money could we raise? Millions every year that could help fund the regional public health bodies. And we've been making this point with security as well. The third point that I also want to underscore is that health security means also for us nutrition security. We manage food imports this time around. That's what we did. But the morbidity factors of COVID reveal that an equally important security <clears throat> is that of nutritional security and health sovereignty related to our diets. What do we eat? Is it good for us? We have now to use our trade policy, our fiscal policy, our land policy, our policy in technology and development finance to internalize the critical benefits of investing in and eating fresh foods versus processed foods. I stopped trying to eat anything in a, ta in a, in a can a few years ago because I worked out that we need to be able to eat things that are going to give our bodies nourishment. And, and half of what we have not done as independent nations is literally to talk to our people and to explain to our people in the same way that we would with a family. So that the notion that it is expensive to eat well has gone on for years and we need literally, literally to, 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 to quash it. Um, the amount of people ever since I spoke in Barbados about people who are eating conquerors and macaroni pie and that they need to put that one side and start to eat some fresh fruit and vegetables, there has been a veritable explosion in terms of um, the delivery of, of fruits and vegetables and I'm coming shortly to the delivery economy. But we have also seen um, a lot of people going into gardening and, and to ensure that we need now to be able to do it. So the delivery economy, where are we? The delivery economy is right now with us. And, and we only need to nurture it. We don't have to establish it anymore. Um, <laughs> what to tell you? Everybody in the course of the last few months were surprised about how the delivery economy emerged without help. And we have, for decades, supermarkets were trying to do it. They never got anywhere. Um, banks were trying to do it. They didn't get any buy-in. And all of a sudden, everybody now realizes that contactless commerce is literally in, in here and needs to be exploited. Um, we have fleets of independent drivers picking up food from farmers and delivering them to consumers as well as to supermarkets. We have people buying food from restaurants and delivering it to offices or to homes. Um, that momentum is there. And what we are trying to do at the local level is to be able to ensure that we can complete the process with digital payments within the next few months so that not only matters pertaining to food, but the delivery of pension checks from our social security security agencies will be a thing of the past that we can literally have welfare benefits and um, child maintenance benefits and all of these things ultimately loaded onto a phone or a card dependent. And we are now moving in our own case in Barbados to the national digital ID, which hopefully will be rolled out over the course of the next six months. So my friends, um, I've spent a few minutes this morning trying to share with you giving you some context with some of the things that I feel that, that we are facing, but that in all of this, I believe that the region has the capacity to be stronger, but it needs to decide that it wants to use its voice. We cannot use our voice by being divided. We cannot use our voice if we cannot even agree on some basic statements that the region has to make in times of grave, grave challenge that the world faces. And I pray that all of us, not just the heads of government, but that the people of the region step back and understand their power in being able to help shape our future, their future, and that it cannot simply be watching on as an audience, but that there has to be a symbiotic relationship as to where we want to take this region. Um, it is for that reason that I am a fervent believer in the social partnership. It is for that reason that as recent as Monday, I brought together all the members of the social partnership as We can only go there if we go with the people 
with us, next to us. And in order for our people to be next to us, to pick up the signs of what they must do in terms of greater safety or greater participation in terms of food security or greater commitment to ensure that the chronic NCDs that literally make COVID worse are put to the past because um, we are using better habits to eat or whether it is in terms of us using trade policy as we're trying to do internationally to be able to ensure that we can have access to more um, mechanisms to protect our domestic agricultural policy, or whether it is the battles that you've heard me speak on for the last few months, and I'm glad that um, that, that our World Bank friend, Ms. Said, is with us because she knows our, our eternal cry that middle-income countries are too rich to be considered um, poor countries and hence benefit from IDA and, and other things that are dependent on IDA. But equally, we are too poor to be considered anywhere close to developed or advanced economies. And as a result, and our small, when combined with our lack of size, our smallness, we are unable to influence or to access things at the level of the market. And the definitional criteria of per capita income Historic per capita income, as is done at the World Bank and elsewhere, is an unfair blow that continues to possess, persist for the Caribbean and does not reflect our reality, our vulnerability, even as we go forward. And similarly, the one that would have sought to deal with COVID-19 by using maternal mortality as a proxy for whether we should be able to be part of a professional consortium of the UN Global Fund in order to be able to procure in vitro diagnostics and 13 countries in the hemisphere are left out of which 10 are in the region. And why? Because we're being penalized because we took the development challenge seriously from independence and even before independence and that we were able to get progress on a number of social things. But that, that, that because we did that did not mean that we have the capacity and the ability to endure Hurricane 5, Category 5 winds from a hurricane or Category 5 winds from a pandemic. The Caribbean cannot be abandoned, and I refuse to accept that we will be invisible for some, uh, invisible for many, and disposable for some. I do believe that our voice as a collective can make this difference because technology and geography have, have literally been reconstructed as a result of the technology that is at our fingertips and the capacity of our people to influence a global community. I thank you. Thank you so much, Prime Minister Motley. So much to think about, you know, just, just a quick recap. You spoke about the importance of our global internal framework and the fact that we really now have a third item in terms of security. It's not just food, energy, but definitely health security. Again, and I've, I've listened to so many of, of, of your um, talks and, and when you've enlightened us and, and being proud to say I am Barbadian and based here as well. So there's a real, a real connection in terms of what you're speaking about, particularly when you spoke about the delivery service and how much we are returning to the land, so to speak. And lastly, you spoke about the Caribbean not being abandoned. And PM Motley, we know with leaders such as yourself, that would never be an option. Thank you again for your time. We yep. do hope that you can stay on um, to answer a few questions, but we understand what your schedule looks like. So we appreciate whatever time you can give us. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. I'll try to stay for a little bit. Thank you so much. So up next, we're going to move on to our second speaker, who would also be looking at a question related, and that's going to be Miss Jacqueline Emmanuel Flood. And Jacqueline is going to address the question of the decline since 9-11 and the fact that is it really the greatest economic decline since then? And more specifically, as um, PM Motley would have shared and set an excellent foundation, how do we as Caribbean countries rejuvenate our economies? And what are the opportunities for growth and investment that have come about as a result of this pandemic? But with that being said, Jacqueline, over to you. Thank you, Marsha, and thank you, distinguished panelists, Honorable Prime Minister, um, Mia Motley, and Minister from Dominica. It is, it is indeed an honor to be on this panel today. 
Um, my presentation is more directly focused on the OECS economies. Um, I will be going perhaps a little slower. I recognize that the, we're having some technical issues. A lot of what um, Minister, um, Prime Minister Motley has mentioned, I will perhaps be talking about, but perhaps not in the same language. So firstly, I would like to ask you and to invite you to take a look back in your rear view mirror with me, um, to look at the journey that the OECS countries have been embarked upon for the past decade. I'm going back a little bit beyond the 9-11, um, the but I'm going to look at the financial crisis from 2008. Um, the impact that we saw in 2008 was severe. Tourism decreased drastically and suddenly. Remittances from abroad were depended upon, declined. Direct foreign investment was reduced. Official development flow for assistance reduced sharply. Growth rates plummeted in the OECS countries. Debt and, fin and fiscal imbalances increased to unsustainable levels and labor market conditions deteriorated. That was a shock. The approach that was taken thereafter, the OECS governments with partners such as the World Bank and the IMF, and back upon a journey to resume growth, for growth and to promote what we call sustainable, inclusive growth. The approach really looked at three interrelated aspects, enhancing competitiveness, public sector modernization, which in essence focused on reducing foreign debt levels and fiscal adjustments to ensure micro sustainability. And the third area was enhanced resilience. When we look at where, what we have accomplished in those 10 years, after more than a decade of pursuing this strategy, I will give you a few quantitative and some qualitative indicators. So you can appreciate where these, our OECS economies were in 2020. In over the decade, we have seen, for example, that the average growth rates of OECS member states between the years 2015 to 2019 was 2.6%. Growth in the five years prior to that, between 2010 and 2014, was 0.6% on average. Prior to this um, COVID-19 pandemic, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank forecast for the OECS economies for 2020 this year was 3.3%. We have seen structurally weak economic growth for the decade. Unemployment rates in the OECS pre was in the range of above 20% in at least three OECS member states. This is the, the position where OECS countries will when they had this head-on collision with COVID-19 in 2020. I take you there to give you an, an, an appreciation for the impact that COVID-19 has brought upon on our already weak economies. You observe impacts, tourism, I think um, the Prime Minister Motley explained that complete closure, manufacturing, closure of the sector with few exceptions, Agriculture, we saw reduced activity. The social sector, health and education were both severely impacted. Mm -hmm. Cultural services, severely impacted. You, even the utility companies in the distribution sector that has been somehow the stay of those economies in some instances, because of the heavy dependence also on tourism, we have seen reduced demand and production. So as the prime minister mentioned, I just want to really distill down on it. COVID-19 exposed some of the realities that we have been speaking about in the OECS. I say the hypothesis has now become the reality. We have seen the low rate of adaptation and adoption of technology in critical sectors, critical sectors that have not been able to respond adequately in this kind of crisis. We have seen especially our businesses and our micro and small enterprises 
have shown that they are not taxed, um, taxed enough. We have seen the business environment, we've exposed the rudimentary and undeveloped financial markets that we've had in our region, e-commerce framework and digital finance infrastructure. We have seen also the, the narrowness of the vision of planning. The impact has been from the microeconomy to the business sector, to the micro and small enterprises where the backbone of our economies, even down to the women in business, because we have a peculiar structure in the, in the Caribbean where we have made, most households are female led and we have seen the impact and that in itself has impacted on the social, the social sector. So having seen all of those things, we, the, OECS, um, the OECS itself, we conducted an economic, a social and economic impact assessment. And much of what I'm sharing with you comes from that document. And I invite you to read the document. It is available on our website, um, which will give you, I think, far more details to what I'm sharing here. The limited social security safety nets, we have seen high unemployment without any um, comp compensation. Our national security systems not prepared to deal with unemployment benefits. And more than anything else, we have seen a paucity of data um, in that we've not been able to conduct proper analysis because of poor investment in our statistical framework. Having said all of that though, there is hope. We have seen also with COVID some in interesting glimmers of hope. These, I have categorized them in four main areas. The first thematic area that I would like to address, I think is digitization, the importance or the potential of digitization. The OECS countries, we've seen, for example, many instances where where we had made some progress in digitization, it has served us well. The education sector has been able to benefit from that because there was some advanced movement to digitize the, the sector. But this is one sector that we have seen that can provide tremendous benefits across the board. The promotion of innovation. We see that there are opportunities to exploit new and innovative sectors, um, the, our, our blue economy, the tremendous resources that we have, areas such as advanced manufacturing, marine biotechnology, using digital platforms to promote services. There are unique opportunities that we have seen. Supporting micro and small enterprises. Micro and small enterprises are still and they remain the backbone of our economies. And we believe that there are many opportunities that we can see to support them. Um, I think, um, we mentioned areas as a delivery service, but there are many others. The need to bring finance into, man, into the micro and, se and sector is another very important area. And I think finally, we have seen the need to foster an evidence-based approach to growth and resilience, to improve our data and statistics so that we can rebound quickly, we can make sound decisions in events like, this, like these. So in terms of the way forward, I'm going to expand a little bit on those in terms of digitization. One of the things we have seen, one area that we think can really benefit us is in our regional integration processes. There are key elements that we've been working on and COVID-19 has shown us that perhaps if we had been, if we had accelerated our processes, we would have been in a better place. For example, the movement towards establishing common border management systems in the OECS is something that we've been working for on for a while. And we recognize that these kinds of systems will help us to move to, to share information, to track health, um, people's health, health movements, et cetera, in pandemics. I mentioned, of course, health, the health sector being able to practice telemedicine, sharing of diagnosis across countries. We can see where digitization can across the board help our economies to grow. Um, I need not emphasize the need for a more inclusive financial sector. Um, we have had projects on our joint board dealing with digital economy, with e-commerce, and this COVID environment has shown us that these solutions are going to be very important to spur us, spur our, our economies in the way forward. In terms of um, innovation, Jackie, I need to, yes? 
Thank you, Jackie. Just, just, yeah. just a gentle reminder uh, in, in the interest of asking you to just um, kindly lead us to, to that, that wrapper point so that we, okay. we ensure that we move on. Thank you so much. And I know you're referring that a lot of this is already on your website because I know our yeah. participants are eager to learn more. Yes, so just thank you, much. Thank you. Remember the time. I just want to wrap up with two two points. Absolutely. I, um, yes, if I may, that um, the the lesson of COVID for investment is giving us the opportunity to own our sustainable development, take better ownership of it. Um, the OECS being small developing economies, the crisis has exposed our economic and social vulnerabilities but it has renewed con in our confidence in our regional integration processes to, to use our integration process as a lever or as a fulcrum, so to speak, to improve our well-being. Um, I want to stress the, the, the focus on inter-regional tourism and trade. We need to focus more on that because we recognize that in this environment, I think the um, Minister Morty has mentioned, we must do more to help each other along and to have to increase and deepen the trade relationships among ourselves. Finally, I want to talk about mainstreaming diversification through innovation and technology. I mentioned some critical areas for investment. And finally, I want to make the final point that in order for those things to happen, we must realize that we must deal with issues of logistics and development of finance. Um, in the report, we've, we've tried to underscore the need for development finance because we've constantly been trying to do things without the financial resources. And we speak of um, establishing a resilience fund, a fund whereby we could make an investment into that fund when things are quote unquote better, so that in times like these, we would have resources that we'd be able to make the changes that we recommend. Um, so in terms of strategic repositioning for OECS, as a result of COVID, um, innovation and technology, empowering our regional integration process, and I would say finally establishing a regional resilience fund. Marsha, thank, thank you. you. I'd like to stop here. All right, thank you very much. And again, thematically, we're seeing um, from what that foundation that PM Motley would have shared, just the importance of us having the frameworks. Um, Jackie would have also spoken about the challenges we have with data and statistics, but also the opportunities we have for our micro industries. So again, Jacqueline, thank you so much. And remember participants, we know that there's a lot to share here and time is of the essence. We wanna get a lot of it in, but this is just a teaser. So if you want to hear more, we look forward to seeing you in September. We're gonna move next to our second, uh, third and fourth panelist members, and that would be Audrey Richards and Shadi Jamat. And they are looking at question three, which is on your screen. And that is what do investors need and what must the private sector do, specifically in this area of, of responding to what is this business unusual? And with that being said, I would like to kick off the response to question three by inviting Audrey to speak. Audrey, welcome. Thank you, Marsha. And good morning. Um, good morning. I would also wish to thank the OECS Commission for inviting me to be part of this panel. Good morning to my fellow panelists um, and indeed a very distinguished panel. It's certainly my pleasure to be here this morning to share my perspective on uh, on Sorry, I'm not seeing my video coming up, sorry. Um, to share my perspective on uh, mobilizing capital in order for our economies to grow. Now, most of the work that we've been doing, I'll start off by focusing really on some of the activities that we've been undertaking at the, at the Development Bank of Jamaica as we have see, sought to improve the access to capital, private capital we've taken what I'd like to refer to as an ecosystem approach. And when I say an ecosystem approach, I would also like to refer to a phrase that we've borrowed from Professor Josh Lerner at um, distinguished professor, professor at Harvard University, where he calls this setting the table. 
So it's not just about mobilizing a big fund. It's understanding what are the different elements within the market and how can we create this market. So when we're talking about the different elements, we're talking about knowledgeable investors and fund managers. We're talking about investment ready entrepreneurs. We're talking about a legal and regulatory framework, which helps to support and is conducive to investment. So what we did is we did a lot of formal training of all stakeholders, entrepreneurs, investors, business advisors, lawyers, and we utilized our communication channels and conferences to certainly build awareness. With that, we were able to mobilize the, the, the private sector and engage the investment community in being able to develop these funds. So the, the development bank, pretty much what our focus has been is that we wanted it to be a private sector led industry. It was never to be about the development bank mobilizing capital in order to put into private company. It was a private sector led activity. So a lot of what we have done is we've seen a lot of the private, based on what we have done, we've seen the private sector certainly coming to the fore. We have seen funds operating in the region and in which DBJ has invested. These funds have been mobilized through the Jamaica Venture Capital Program. Um, the private capital has come to the fore and they've seen them raising capital of over 350 million US dollars over the past five to six years. Um, compare that to perhaps about under 40 million US dollars um, in funding that has been raised over the last, I would say 25 years prior to that. So we certainly saw, as I said, where private capital began to come to the fore and began to take their rightful place. Of that amount, just under half of that 350 million was raised from Jamaican investors. And as well, we have seen angel investors coming to the fore and investing their own capital. So with that, we believe that we, the, the work that we've done has made some impact. But even with that, there were gaps. The deal flow was still not there and we had to understand what was happening. So what some of the things that we have done is we've designed new initiatives. We've looked at how can we boost innovation and growth and entrepreneurship? Um, we looked at funding, funding, Entrepreneurs are not homogenous, are not a homogenous group. The needs of a startup are different from the needs of a growth entrepreneur, are different from the needs of an established business, um, and it needs and different from the needs of somebody, an entity that is going into long-term um, infrastructure projects. So we had to look at funding at different stages. So these are some of the, the areas that we, have, we are rolling out in Jamaica. Um, and of course, funding for digital transformation was also a major aspect of this rollout. So we've also looked at encouraging venture capital and SME funds. So with that, what we have, what we're looking at is, we thought we had it, you know, we were on the right track, except that COVID came along. So what we've seen with COVID, of course, everybody knows a significant disruption, the market volatility, the investment sentiment is really risk off and flight to safety. Our asset values are falling. And of course, there's a big focus on liquidity and number of businesses on the water. Our expectation also in terms of any foreign capital coming in needs to be on hold because in a lot of instances, the, the, the foreign capital is going to stay in their own domestic markets. So we're going to have to look at how we can create that leadership within the region where capital is concerned. It makes no sense waiting on the external capital to be able to solve our capital needs. So pretty much in looking at where do we go in this post-COVID um, era, there's no silver bullet. 
So we believe that we need to continue the disciplined approach that we started where it comes to ecosystem building. We need to continue as well as expand on the strategies aimed at supporting entrepreneurs and to provide a key infrastructure. When I say key infrastructure, I'm speaking to things like the, inf the, incubation, the incubators, the accelerators, the kind of services that our business service intermediaries provide, the quality of those services, um, looking at tailoring grants to specific groups. So pretty much the, as sectors have been impacted in different ways, we have to look at how the different businesses um, within these sectors have been in, impacted. So capital requirements are really going to be different. Um, looking at the different capital sources, the traditional and the alternatives, I think alternative investments are really going to come into their own in this environment. We need to create tailored solutions, whether it's for private equity, private credit, mezzanine funding, convertible shares, um, and private private equity, venture capital, um, and different types of funds based on the different entities, the different companies that need this, the, need this funding. Digital ad adoption has accelerated. So businesses with technology linked solutions are going to be of interest to investors and to venture capital funds. Where's this capital to come from? Fund managers raise capital from domestic investors, regional DFIs and international development partners. However, investors have different risk preferences. So a startup risk profile is different from that of a growth company. So where investors are faced with decisions at this time, they're, all, they're always looking for opportunities. So it's not a matter of them sitting on their hands, but they're rational persons. They're looking at where really weighing safety against holding, holding their cash versus deploying that cash and the timing of that deployment. If there are the health issues sufficiently under control to start deploying that capital and which sectors have been resilient and now represent really good prospects, which businesses, looking at the individual businesses, which businesses have pivoted their business models to take advantage of the new normal. Investors don't like to lose their money, but they, they want returns for the in keeping with the risk. So the post-COVID strategies may have changed as they, they're, they're, pre, they're post-COVID, whatever they had anticipated doing pre-COVID, the investors are now re-looking at those strategies post-COVID. So pretty much a lot of the, um, the support infrastructure said has to be there um, from the investment bankers, the business advisors, to be able to work with the entrepreneurs. I believe that there is opportunity for impact investors. There is opportunity for, for progress on the SDGs. Uh, when we look at key sectors like health, education, the financial sectors, all of these can benefit significantly from the new business models and technology adoption. And of course, there's a huge opportunity for infrastructure funds to be able to, to take us through um, the, the kind of large scale um, business opportunities. So pretty much when we look at post COVID and what needs to be done, um, I would also like to join um, with what um, Prime Minister Motley indicated, that we need to have our voice and our visibility out there. Um, individually, we're small, but our influence and our capacity to build markets can be done effectively through partnerships. So when we're looking at, we have to look at how can we collaborate? Um, the, when, we, when it comes to the capital markets, Capital doesn't really know any, any, any boundaries. They go where the opportunities are. So if we can share our best practices across our markets, and when I say the, the Caribbean markets, I'm looking at English, Spanish, French, Dutch-speaking um, Caribbean. As a collective, we are probably just under 50 million, and th that creates the kind of um, substantial, substantial market which makes investments um, really worthwhile. So I, I'll stop there um, and you know, happy to answer any questions afterwards.
not him. You're on mute, Marsha. Yes, and there I am speaking at length. I was just saying thank you so much, Audrey. And um, again, the theme of us acting as a collective. We're gonna segue quickly into Shade Jamalt. And Shade, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to deliver a few remarks ahead of what I expect to be a spirited discussion. I've been asked to approach the same question as Audrey, but in a bit centric way. So first of all, I must say that I love the title of this webinar because to be frank, if the Caribbean really wants to recover quickly and be more resilient, we cannot do the things that we've always done. We have to step outside of our comfort zone and make bold moves. Being a region of, and PM Motley spoke about this, being a region of mostly small island developing states means that we're part of a distinct group of developing countries with specific social, economic, and environmental vulnerabilities, including limited resources, high volatility of economic growth, vulnerability to external shock, and disproportionately expensive public administration and infrastructure. And what this translates into is an urgent need for development to be about more than economies. It has to transform our societies in real ways for real people. And BIT's mission is to enable payments and empower people. And the slide I've chosen attempts to describe each layer of our software stack so that I don't have to in the interest of time which allows me instead to zero in on the principle that underpins the whole stack, which is financial inclusion. And this transcends recovery in order to facilitate transformation. And it contributes significantly to at least eight of the 17 sustainable development goals. So if we're talking recovery and resilience, financial inclusion has to be central in the conversation as it can literally save and transform lives. It can also reorient, reorient the region vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. And that has been implied throughout all of the, the, the presentations that preceded mine. By being among the first movers on technology like what BIT offers, developing countries can reposition themselves as policy makers and not just policy takers. So for example, we're seeing a global awakening to the fact that digital currencies are an inevitability at this point. But because the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank had the vision and foresight to embark on a digital currency pilot about a year before COVID-19 created a greater imperative, we see a phenomenon where central banks around the world are now looking to this region for insights. And on this point, I have to applaud Governor Antoine and his team for recognizing the region's critical realities, such as the fact that after a category four or five hurricane ravages an island, three to four weeks is way too long to wait for access to your money and to aid, especially when digital currencies could leverage the telecommunications infrastructure to grant access sooner. Implementation of software stats like BITS also means less foreign exchange leakage, lower transaction fees, and a faster, more secure way to do business. These are all important factors for resilience and recovery in a region where remittances contribute so significantly to GDP and our informal sectors are so large. We shouldn't have to wait for a pandemic or a natural disaster to innovate. We already know that we are acutely affected by global phenomena and that we sit in a hurricane belt. We have experienced earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, the threat of tsunamis, and the effects of global warming. We know that we need to be more resilient. We also know that we need to leapfrog in terms of key development indicators, but none of this will be possible until we appreciate that as a region, our imperatives are materially different and far more pressing than others, especially in the global north. So we have to look within for leadership on our concerns. As it relates to investors, they care about the bottom line. Many may appreciate the correlation between risk and reward, but they do not want avoidable exposure. So in my mind, the private sector needs to mitigate against foreseeable risk. And that means implementing things like business continuity plans. I think COVID-19 reveals systemic weaknesses here, not just at the business level, but perhaps even at the national level, the regional level. 
ultimately, in my opinion, it comes down to ensuring that things do not actually go back to normal or the way that they were. Across the Caribbean, we now know the importance of e-commerce for business continuity. We have proven, as Pierre Motley mentioned, that delivery services are in fact feasible and that bodies do not need to be chained to an office building in order to be productive. We now know these things that were long denied. So now what? We would have wasted the crisis if we do not now capitalize on what it has taught us, which is more or less that normal is no longer good enough. And in this connection, I think we need to address the investment culture in the region. We need to create an enabling environment for risk takers and provide adequate support. One has to wonder, for example, would Amazon be Amazon if it had started anywhere in the Caribbean? At the same time, I have also noticed that entrepreneurs do not understand that there's no such thing as a free lunch. Money for equity is the deal. So if you want investment, you have to be willing to give up some of your control. However, some will rather have 100% of something small and stunted than 40% of something large and dynamic. So culturally, we really need to examine ourselves. We need to also find other ways to fund enterprise. Financial institutions, they need to be less conservative when it comes to lending to entrepreneurs. We also need venture capitalists and not vultures. I would also like to see crowdfunding take root in the region in a real way. I think that these are all ways that we can recalibrate the brand of a country and a region post COVID, um, but we must first put our house in order and then send a message to the rest of the world that we're open for business, but business unusual. And I'll stop here for now. Thank you so much, Shadi, and, and such, such passion uh, in terms of your presentation. I love the takeaway of this is the new normal and the provocative question of now what? Now what do we do? Yes. So looking forward to hearing more from you sometime in September, hopefully. <laughs> um, participants, I, I want you to know that we are a bit over, but we did start late as well. So we're going to ask you to beg, we beg your indulgence. There's so much to be shared still. We have two more presenters before we pass over to Dr. Jules who would close and then of course take your questions. I'm also seeing folks are posting questions in the chat. I encourage you to please post your questions in the Q&A section, please, because in so doing, we'll be better able to address them at the end of the session. So before I move on to Tassin Saheed from the World Bank, gentle reminder that we will be going on beyond the uh, shared time or publicized time to potentially another, I would say 20 or 25 minutes. So we beg your indulgence. As we move to the final question, it's my pleasure to ask Tassin to kick off the session. Um, and the question here is, if not tourism, what? And that is so pertinent to our um, economies. And we're looking at what are the li likely implications of the current talent pool and what will be done to ensure that our people are indeed ready. With that being said, over to you, Tassin. Thank you very much, Marsha. Good afternoon to everyone. I see that over 800 uh, participants are here uh, and uh, really hello to the panel. It is indeed a distinguished panel. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, Prime Minister Mia Motley is there or not. If she's not, I just want this message to be passed on to her that uh, Madam Prime Minister, at least from the World Bank side, let me reiterate that the Caribbean is very much visible, present and has influence and will continue to do so as long as we have uh, 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 champions like yourself and supporters uh, within the World Bank. So I just wanted to start with that. Uh, indeed, uh, the economies of the Caribbean have been uh, hugely disproportionately impacted uh, by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. One uh, little uh, uh, language point that I wanted to mention, I'm hearing a lot post COVID. Uh, we need to recognize that we are going to be in the process of being in COVID rather than post for some time because there, we may open the lockdown, but it's not a post COVID. It's not over yet. So that's the new normal. I think that all of us need to be quite conscious of having said that, uh, uh, I do want uh, uh, all of us to start with the applaud for the Caribbean that the Caribbean countries, the small islands, especially have been 
really been able to be contain the epidemic uh, with the extremely rapid uh, measures that were taken right at the start, even when there were one or two cases, and also the lockdown and social distancing measures, which has been, I think, really a, a very smart process going forward. But at the same time, the economic consequences have been severe. As uh, Prime Minister Mia Motley said, uh, that these are countries, uh, islands heavily dependent on trade and also tourism. As we know that average of 30 to 50% of the GDP for, all this, for the small islands, many of the small islands comes from uh, tourism sector. At the same time in 2020, this is the year that we are in, uh, the, GDP, the GDP contraction for the region is going to be huge from five to 9%. By one estimate of the World Bank, uh, we are seeing that job losses uh, globally, but also in this region, uh, we are seeing about one uh, fourth uh, or to one third of the labor force. Having said that, uh, the countries have taken significant measures, uh, both on the social side and on the economic side, to actually help uh, the, uh, the population weather the impact of this uh, crisis. And that's been about, again, a heavy cost of three to four percent average in the Eastern Caribbean of GDP of, of, of these measures. In that context, I just want to give that broader context. Uh, where do we go, uh, if not tourism, what? Let me first say that before I enter into if not tourism, what? Uh, let me say that tourism itself needs support. Uh, it is important to maintain this support, to keep the lights on, and also to enable businesses, many businesses connected to the tourism sector, to not exit once uh, the economy begins to open up. And this is critical because tourism is connected to various other small uh, enterprises. It's connected to jobs, especially for women and youth. Uh, the second aspect from the tourism side that I wanted to just mention is that it is also an opportunity given the situation now to rethink the tourism model in a way reimagining tourism for the Caribbean. And there, uh, Many of you may know, I'm not going to give you any new data, but uh, the, uh, the, uh, the rise of tourism or increase of tourism in the Caribbean uh, has not been uh, very, very high. Uh, to give you two numbers, for the uh, Eastern Caribbean, the annual growth uh, from 2005 to 2017, tourism growth has been about 0.6%. The Asian Pacific Islands in the same period registered a tourism growth average annually of 6.4%. The Caribbean as a whole is at 2.7%. So what is it that is uh, making a difference there in the Asian Pacific and it's less over here? Those are the questions that we need to look at uh, and to see that how best to make the tourism sector more competitive globally going forward. Uh, having said that, I wanted to mention this because I don't want us to think that, you know, tourism, because it's not happening today, uh, we don't need to think through of the future uh, impacts. Now, diversification. We're, uh, we've already, uh, one, uh, one benefit of coming late is that others have spoken what you wanted to say, but one also other benefit is that uh, you can go a bit deeper into the point. Uh, two things have been discussed a lot already. One is the blue economy. I think that's not a lot. It's only mentioned by the OECS Commission, I think. And the second is on the digital agenda. On the blue economy, uh, we have, I think, in, in, the, in the Caribbean, there's a lot of recognition of the role and the contribution of uh, the blue economy. And what is the blue economy? This is your vast, pristine ocean resources. Uh, for uh, the Caribbean, the question to ask, why not tourism? Uh, what else is there? And the key question is, where is the comparative advantage of the Caribbean? And the first is really the, the blue economy resources. Let me go a bit into that. Uh, let's take the example of capture fisheries. Uh, this is already a well-established practice in the region. Uh, fisheries contribute about $460 million uh, annually uh, in the, in the region, generating average of 4% of jobs, but much more in some of the smaller um, islands, like in, in the OECS countries. And this, the sector's output and productivity can be dramatically enhanced. 
A second, aquaculture is another uh, nascent area of production for the region. And there, the contribution right now is not that large. It's about $48 million annually. But uh, there's a great uh, opportunity, such as in the in CMOS and shellfish farming. These are all growing sectors globally. Uh, coming to another opportunity through the blue economy is on renewable energy. This is a sector with huge potential and the maritime res marine resources are increasingly viable and able to produce offshore capacity such as wind capacity as well. Uh, OECD's uh, ocean economy in 2030 report says that uh, global emp employment in renewable energy area will grow by about 12 fold. So it's important to keep those uh, perspectives in mind going forward. Coming to what else is, is important vis-a-vis -vis the blue economy sector is uh, jobs, medium and small enterprises. Some, this was mentioned earlier on, but again, uh, the region is so rich in human capital with a vibrant youth population that's eager to, every time I travel to the region, to the countries, I'm struck by the eagerness of the youth to innovate and think out of the box. So revenue from coastal and marine resources and processing of high value fish products is something that can be really uh, an important uh, contribution, not just to jobs, but also to economic growth. Uh, we were told, uh, I recall in St. Lucia, there was a local company that was innovating solutions for sargassum seaweed, seaweed converting it into agriculture biostimulant. The world market for biostimulants is estimated to be worth US dollar 2.8 billion in 2021, 2.8 billion. I quote these numbers because to show that there are huge opportunities right at your doorstep, or I would say water step in, in, in the blue economy area. The second point I wanted to highlight is the digital economy. A lot has been said, so I will not say all that I had planned to, but I do want to say that this can help in overcoming the challenge of scale for the Caribbean. It can help in efficiency of transactions for the citizenry uh, at all uh, levels, whether it's the interaction of the citizenry with the state or private interactions. And uh, the, the discussion on the bits and, and was mentioned just now, but beyond that, this is a sector where digital services industry can be phenomenally important for the, for the region because the region possesses the key, key comparative advantage and that is English language and uh, the ability to uh, then, and, and education as well, to be able to be competitive in the digital sector. In some cases, the local ICT industries are indeed small, but they hold great promise and to provide high quality services. And again, these are services where uh, both men, women, girls, boys can be, youth can be involved as well. So, having this kind of an economic dynamism is not an easy task, but this is where the partnerships come in. The partnerships of the state with the private sector, which is a huge role to play. Uh, the private sector in terms of the medium and small enterprises, the private sector in terms of helping on the digital side. So I do want to underscore that this partnership is not the responsibility of the state alone, but also the connecting to the private sector and the private sector's role as well. One uh, critical point that I do want to touch upon um, uh, is, uh, and uh, this is as the head of the CARICOM, uh, Prime Minister Motley is very, very uh, close to this point is economic integration, regional economic integration. This is critically important as integrating on two sides, globally, which is key for the Caribbean as it enables technology transfers as well as access to larger markets. Regionally, it is also essential as it helps to lower the cost of services and through increasing returns to scale. It also raises competitiveness and attracts foreign investment more when there's a bigger and connected pool. So it is extremely central to, I think, any discussion we are having on diversification or looking at the growth agenda in parallel to tourism. I would not say putting tourism aside in parallel to tourism. Finally, uh, I had mentioned uh, this earlier about the language and the fact that uh, you have this uh, advantage of, uh, of youth and, uh, and, and educated youth. There is no reason that we cannot have an aspirational goal that the next generation of globally renowned marine engineers, aquaculturalists and entrepreneurs 
and not come from the Caribbean region. And that's where I would end. Thank you. Masha, I hope I was under my eight minutes. It was an interesting conversation. I stopped looking at time for a bit. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. As all of our presenters have been, and I'm sure our participants also feel similarly, um, quite a bit of good information. Let's go right into a hearing on the same topic from Minister Denise Charles, representing the Commonwealth of Dominica. Minister Charles. Thank you, Marsha. Good morning to Prime Minister Mia Motley, the other distinguished women on the panel, our Zoom audience. I bring you greetings on behalf of our Prime Minister, Dr. Roosevelt Scarrett, who could not be with us today, but has sent me and my other colleagues, Minister Laville, Minister of the Digital Economy, Minister Fidel Grant, Minister of Agriculture, Minister Rivera, Minister of Economic Develop Affairs, to represent him. The OECS emerged out of the desire by member governments and the people of our respective countries for greater economic integration. Our post-independence, social and economic history accounts for the supreme institutions such as the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, the OECS Secretariat, and the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, just to name a few. While we have had our challenges, our social and economic achievements transcend the negative forces that we continue to confront. Our 50 years of independence registers economic, political, and climatic events of varying dimension and intensity. Today, we are dealing with the consequences of a global health pandemic that has infected over 8 million globally and killed well over half a million. In the OECS, the number of infections has reached over 128 with only three deaths. In responding to this pandemic, all our countries have had to implement the closure of borders, lockdown of economies, and set up systems of containment and management of COVID-19. The lockdown of economies has had very serious implications for revenue, while the management of the disease itself has imposed a high level of expenditure. But we are not dismayed. We will emerge from this crisis together stronger. At this critical juncture in our history, we must embrace our mandate more than ever before to promote the spirit and practice of cooperation, economic interdependence, and solidarity to advance our charter of economic integration and create wealth. All our countries have now transitioned from agriculture-based economies to services. The contribution of agriculture to GDP now ranges from 2% to 15% among our countries. We have succeeded in attaining economic restructuring and growth on the platforms of regional understanding, visioning, action, and accountability. We have all signed up to the Sustainable Development Goals and are all committed to its attainment for the well being of our people. Within the structure of this historical context, we would like to propose a framework that allows for three levels of intervention in response to the question raised and to chat all way forward. One, individual country level, two, between country level, and three, OECS level. In doing so, we'll focus on the following sectors agriculture digital economy, and renewable energy. Our OECS countries, as Ms. Richards said, has a long history of mainly engaging in, in productivity in production of, of importing agricultural produce. More than half a billion of our food requirements annually is imported from the US. 
We must therefore strive to keep at least half of the money in our region. At the individual country level, a process of progressive agricultural diversification and modernization must gain momentum. It must involve an enabling policy framework that engenders public-private partnerships in the production of a variety of high value crops rooted in the competitive advantage of each country that reflects local soil conditions, geography, production facilitation, and climatic condition. For example, countries with fat lands and fertile soils can engage in large scale production of crops that require automation. Dominica, where lands are mainly hilly, can engage in high value niche market crops to suit its microclimatic conditions. This will require a sector where crop subsectors are upgraded, organized, and scaled up to the level of industries that are geared towards foreign exchange savings and receipts. Since tourism will be with us for a while longer, our modern and high productivity agriculture must feed into the tourism industry. There must be greater linkages between our agricultural supplies and the demands in tourism. This new agriculture must meet our domestic food demand, supply, catering for special tastes and appetites. If we are able to cut our food import bill by 50%, this could result in over 100,000 direct or indirect jo jobs in our region with beneficial spillovers. Between countries provides an opportunity to create an OECS value chain where different segments of the chain can be located in member countries based on comparative advantage. It is possible for one or two countries to produce the raw materials and supply an agro-processing or manufacturing plant based in another country. Is it also possible for another country to provide the testing and branding services and for another to supply the packaging material. This is quite possible and is already happening in, with soap manufacturing in Dominica. At the level of the OECS, economic integration needs more concerted action. We have the experience of the banana industry. Since we are all small producers, it makes economic sense to aggregate our products in a collective marketing arrangement because no one country can meet the demand of a large market. Through the application of modern technologies, a competitive production, distribution, and marketing system can be created. This could help create a circular economy in the OECS with the only major risk being that of multiple contagion at the OECS level. Hence the needs to cater for negative externalities through systems of risk management, redundancies, and security. In addition to agriculture, the digital economy also holds promise. It can actually change the way business is conducted and contribute to efficiency and national productivity. The creation of a digital public service that provides optimal services at a reduced cost can contribute to economic growth and transformation. It will also help to improve the image of the state and enhance the accountability profile of connectivity to rural populations. So in closing, I would like to say, and a lot has been said about the digital economy, that the sustainable models that we propose above will help build resilience in the people and economies of our region and create a circular economy. And what else? A reimagined diversified tourism industry. So now more than ever, it is time as in the, in the independent nations that we recognize that our real transformation will emerge from making decisions that factor interdependencies and impact on each other to achieve the quality of life we desire for all our people in the region. In the words of Prime Minister Mia Motley and my Prime Minister, it is time for us to act as one now. Thank you for this opportunity. 
Thank you so much, Minister Charles. And I think quite a fitting close that incorporated the key messages of all of our panelists. And to bring a more formal close to today's proceedings prior to we take prior to us taking questions, I'm going to invite Dr. Jules to summarize. And then, as I mentioned, we'll take some questions from you, our participants. Dr. Jules. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. This has been an exceedingly rich conversation. Um, one of the challenges of the Caribbean is that we never lack ideas. We are very rich in ideas. Our challenge is one of implementation and how to practicalize this, these ideas. It would be really presumptuous of me to attempt to synthesize the richness of this conversation, but I, we have taken extensive notes. The, the entire webinar has been recorded, so we will be making that available online for all participants and persons who did not attend to still have the opportunity to listen and to view. But I can assure you at the level of the commission, we will be synthesizing all of these ideas. Um, Jackie in her presentation spoke to the impact study that we had done at the commission on the impact of COVID on the OECS. Um, in there, there are a number of ideas that are synchronous with um, what has been exposed today, what has been ex expanded today. So we are going to try to bring all of this together within a framework, an integrated framework for, for action. Um, all, of this, all of the participants have made a major contribution to this dialogue. Um, Minister, Prime Minister Motley, of course, very good on the big picture and the, this sort of synthesizing and quintessentializing our, our challenge. Um, we have to thank Minister Charles for really making it real and practicalizing what it is that, we are, that, we, that we've been talking about because she, she took the, the, the innovations and the ideas and made them real in the context of Dominica and locating that in the wider remit of the OECS itself. As we have said repeatedly since Maria, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. Um, so we, need, we, we, we take this into account. Um, the big picture coming out of all of this, colleagues, is that yes, we can, we can do this. We can do this and we have to do it for ourselves. We can rely on the assistance of friends, we can rely on the on the solidarity of, of, of uh, development partners and their assistance. But at the end of the day, what we see happening post-COVID, when I say, well, we, the term post-COVID is dubious, but in the era of COVID, the big lesson is that we are moved from a globalization process to what is going to be increasingly be a regionalization process with localized expression of value chains, of production chains, et cetera. So we are gonna take all of this into account and we will, be, um, we will be running it back to participants in this seminar. The, it's not about the conversation, just the conversation is not just a conversation, it's a movement. We, we want to use this to catalyze the actions that we have to take. As has been said before, there are things that we've been talking about for the last 20 years to do, and they were done in two weeks. With the, shut, the shutdown of schools, for example, we have been forced to move to digitization of, of learning, online learning. These are things that we've been talking about, but we've, we've dragged our feet on. And in two weeks because of COVID, we've had no choice but to get there. That speaks to our potential. And the excuse about us having no money is not no longer a valid excuse. Uh, we've seen from the other presentations by Shadi, for example, talking about bit and digital currency. Um, we've seen the, the Audrey's presentation on venture capital. There is that we have indigenous capital that we can mobilize. There are digital opportunities that we need to, we need to bring into the picture. And so the problem is not one of money, but it's, it's imagination. It is not a money problem, it is an imagination problem. And I want to thank everyone who's been on this seminar, on this webinar, and um, we look forward to not just keeping the conversation going, but to developing the roadmaps for rapid action that this current era of world history requires. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Jules. All right, so before we get into the final proceedings for today, I'm just gonna take some questions and we have quite a few questions. Dr. Jules has already addressed how we will be managing them. So we're just gonna take a few of those questions now. And the first one will go to, um, I would like to suggest Pierre Motley, if you're still online perchance. I am, but I'll ha I'm gonna have to leave soon, but I'm here for now. Well, then I'm going to ask you to please indulge us for the first question. And that is, how do we ensure that island nations in the region truly act as one block in decision making and implementation of protocols? They part, part, part of the difficulty, uh, you, can, you were continuing, sorry? No, no, that's fine, please. Part, part of the difficulty is that CARICOM, Caribbean community, is a community of sovereign nations. And therefore, given that it is a community of sovereign nations, we have, we have to be able to make sure that um, the region understands that so that very often countries retain the right to make their own decisions. Um, I think that the presence of COVID and the extent to which it is going to destabilize our macroeconomic um, fundamentals, as well as our growth potential, means that we really have now to start a conversation to determine whether there should not be deeper integration on a number of areas, not just functional cooperation, which is part of the community's work, but on a number of larger geopolitical issues that I spoke to at the beginning, because our voice and our capacity to be able to make that difference in the market is not as sharp as it ought to be um, if we were working in a singular way with each other. Um, I feel strongly that the missing link is the population pressure, that our populations have the capacity to be able to direct governments by being able to work with us and to determine the directions in which we go. But that means continuous conversation. And that potentially means looking at deeper and other forms of integration as we go forward in a world that has changed significantly from what it was a year ago. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister Motley. And that actually transitions nicely into the next question. And if I may once again beg your indulgence, you spoke about the importance of food security and strengthening the entire Caribbean region and the importance of OECS unity. Minister Charles also spoke about the Dominica's thrust in agriculture. So the question is, as we know, certain countries like Dominica also have an ag agricultural based economy. How and what plans may be in place to allow the, our islands to support each other in regards to agriculture and the surpluses that may exist? Well, fortunately for us, um, just over a year ago, we, we, we required movement. In fact, it was in the February meeting I believe in St. Kitts, we required movement um, on the whole issue of, of private sector production. Um, we had met in Trinidad in December 2018 and agreed that we need to focus on four key areas in terms of production. And one of those was food security. So that the, the Caribbean private sector organization has formed. They've actually done a study to see how they can replace some of the import bill that we have in with respect to poultry, with respect to vegetables, etc. So we're well on our way to being able to do that because we set targets as to what we can reduce in terms of our import bill over the next few years. Clearly, COVID has forced the issue even more. And what we, um, but at the same time, it paused the process that I was working on with respect to maritime transport, because it's no good only producing for your own country if we don't have the logistics for you to trade within the region. So I really feel that the food security project is a project that we have to deliver to Caribbean people to reduce our import bill, but also to keep us healthier. The level of chronic NCDs, as I said, the prevalence of it in the region is way too high. And if we can do, you know, when you claim ground and you claim you have a habit of success, you will be successful at other things. We need to few, choose a few things. And we chose food security. We chose renewable energy. We chose 
um, maritime and air transport, which is even more complex now post-COVID, um, in COVID, sorry. And finally, we chose ICT so that we were ahead of the game in terms of where we're going. As Didica says, we've perfected the art of ideas. We're struggling with the act of implementation. But I do believe that we've come some way. Um, St. Vincent has been taking responsibility for food security for me, obviously, because Guyana, which is normally the lead country, as you know, has been married in some difficulties in the last two to three months. Um, and we have been making progress with respect to how to better coordinate enhance production, but we have now to deal with the logistics. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Prime Minister Motley. And again, thank you for your time. Of course, we would love thank that you. you came on. Um, thank but you. We appreciate it. Most, most, most um, happy to be here. And Didicus, I want to congratulate the OECS for taking this initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister Motley. Welcome, Pian. Thank you. The next question is directed to um, Ms. Richards, Audrey. Uh, any thoughts to manufacturing coming to the islands using the symbiotic relationships within the sector? And what are your thoughts specifically around clusters? And do they already exist? And this is, of course, based on the, this is based on the presentation you'd have shared and the tactics that can be employed specifically around uh, this area. Audrey? Okay. Um, when it comes to, are you hearing me? Yes. When um, it comes to mani right. When it comes to manufacturing, I think the the issue is uh, whatever is being manufactured. Um, you know, all the inputs and being able to create products that are going to be competitive, have a market. I think once there is that ability to be able to create competitive products in a particular country, in a particular, for a particular market, I think investors would have an interest. So it's not a mode, you know, in manufacturing, selecting just one place. It's a matter of what is it that it, you're going to be able to create? Is it going to be competitive? Is there a market? Um, you know, is this the best place to manufacture? That is why this whole you know, globalization discussion is there in, um, in relation to moving manufacturing to different places. So I think once that can be demonstrated. In relation to, to clusters, again, being able to forge the kind of kinds of partnerships amongst businesses that will be will enable the businesses to focus on um, how it is that they can combine their their business models to be able to create something again that's that's competitive for a, a particular market i th this is one of the the areas that we have looked at in jamaica and as i mentioned in relation to boosting innovation and entrepreneurship the whole issue of clusters is something that we are also looking at because we see the need for those kinds of partnerships being able to to bring together these you know similar businesses in order to maximize how it is that they can um, produce for a particular value chain. Absolutely. Thank you. So, um, and I think funding, the funding that is there, um, you know, in, in many instances, it will be either partnerships along the value chain or there can be, as I said, in, in Jamaica, one of the, the, the initiatives is that how can we actually Produce, um, create the kind of funding within those clusters that will be able to take them to another level. Thank you, Audrey. Um, I'd like to direct this next question to Minister Charles and also um, Dr. Jules. And it talks about job creation, um, job creation specifically in our islands, given the vulnerabilities of the region and, of course, our reliance, which was a topic of discussion today on tourism. How will our respective governments create new jobs? How, do, how can our governments help in the creation and support of small businesses, specifically in regards to retooling? What are your thoughts in that regard? And let's start off with uh, Minister Charles. Um, and I see Minister Charles, pardon me. I, I see there's been a switch. We now have, may I have your name, sir? You're on mute, please. This, this minister is here. Hi. 
Good morning, Minister Rivera. Thank you for joining us. And Minister Charles did introduce you in her opening. So did you hear the question? It's around job creation. And I'd like you to take a, a first stab at that, please. Yeah, well, I, I think the most important thing uh, is the question of preparation. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, COVID-19 has provided an opportunity uh, where we, the, 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 the people in the region have to realize that we cannot put all our eggs in one basket. And um, we see opportunities in construction, we see opportunity uh, in the financial sector, we see opportunity uh, in renewable energy, as mentioned by uh, um, 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 Minister Denise Charles. Uh, what we have to do is to be able to prepare ourselves to take advantage of these opportunities. Uh, in preparation, of course, we have to retool. Uh, at the same time, we have to ensure that we have uh, sufficient training programs. We have to ensure uh, that people are, are, are educated in those fields. Uh, in, for, for example, in Dominica, uh, we see that we have a boom in construction. Uh, quite a number of uh, infrastructure development all over the country. So you have uh, health centers being built all over the place, uh, hospitals, uh, uh, you have a, a boom in, in, in housing. Uh, you, you, you have also the, the new construction of the international airport that will be coming on board soon. We need people to fill those positions. And if we do not have the, the, um, the skills uh, we're going to find a problem uh, where we ourselves cannot make our own demands. So I think the, the, the most important thing is that of being prepared to take advantage of all the opportunities that are going to be created uh, coming out of this crisis. Thank you, Minister. Dr. Jules, any additional thoughts in that regard around job creation? Yeah, sure. Um, well, COVID has exacerbated the unemployment situation in the OECS and the rest of the Caribbean, but certainly for the tourism dependent economies, it's, they have been particularly hard hit in the OECS. 46% of the jobs in the OECS, it is estimated, come from tourism. So at one single stroke, we've had, we, we find ourselves suffering massive unemployment and a real reversal of the valiant efforts made by governments over the years to try to progressively reduce the unemployment rate. This provides us nevertheless with some opportunities. We have seen the need to, in fact, in the early stages of the shutdown, um, Minister Charles of Dominica, oh, sorry, not Dominica, of Grenada, uh, Modest Charles, said, raised the issue of us assisting with short-term training for workers in the tourism sector to retool themselves. And in fact, what we've been doing is in the OECS, working with the, the ministries of tourism to look at the utilization of online training that is relevant to the, either to the tourism sector or which may have application in new job opportunities for persons to, to do their retraining while they sort of on lockdown at home. Um, but we are now come with we are now coming with about to launch a more formal initiative, the 5,000 Jobs Initiative, that will see specific training directed into the to di di digital jobs across the OECS. Um, and this is very well suited coming out of the experience of the shutdown because persons have been at home. We've done everything is being done online. Um, there are huge opportunities in the digital economy for. The, it, it represents perhaps our best opportunity for rapid uh, deployment of employment in the OECS. So we are going to be doing that training to target 5,000 digital jobs. Um, the focus is going to be on youth, uh, the one within the youth sector, youth at risk with the law, because we have a project with USAID that we look into retool to take account of that. And... Um, it's going to focus on, on youth, women, particularly single-headed households, um, the differently able and recent retirees. So we are hoping with that targeted group that we can make a real difference in, um, in the de addressing the employment, the unemployment um, situation. Thank you, Dr. Jules. 
And in the interest of time, we're just going to take one more question. And as Dr. Jules would have noted, the entire session has been recorded. A lot of the questions asked actually were answered in some of the presentations. So we encourage you to go back to that um, website, OEC, S, SDM, and remember to join the movement. So our last question is directed to Ms. Jamot, and it's specifically around harmonization of the monetary system within CARICOM. And the question is asking for your thoughts in terms of how we will do that, specifically around the use of the digital financial services and the requisite legislative framework. So the question is asking specifically around harmonization and the legislative framework that would enable us to get to where we need to get to based on your presentation. Ms. Okay. Jamal? So that's a very loaded question. I wrote an entire master thesis on, on that. So to publish that and share. <laughs> yes, I, I'll share the link um, actually. But essentially, if I can break it down into a very, in a, in a sound bite, Bit the, the Caribbean Development Bank and several of our strategic partners have actually been working on something we've, we've called the Caribbean Settlement Network, which is a vision which sees us as a region being able to leverage digital technologies to facilitate trade, to facilitate commerce, to be able to achieve the dream of greater economic integration because we recognize that you know we've had the CSME for a number of years but we really have only have this have the CSM we really haven't had the E yet and we think that the E could be added using digital currency by being able to create a, a kind of synthetic monetary union without necessarily having to tackle some of the issues that present in, in establishing a monetary union in the traditional sense. So in the interest of time, I really can't go into to all the details, but I definitely think that digital currencies are a solution and that when I look across the region and I look across the world rather, the Caribbean region stands to benefit the most, in my opinion, from adopting digital currencies and leveraging it for our development because we have a situation where we have an extremely high mobile penetration rate. I think some estimates put it as high as 140%, which means that a large population mm -hmm. has two, two smartphones. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you marry that with the fact that we have very high levels of unbanked and underbanked people, we have very large informal sectors, it's a perfect recipe for us to leverage digital currencies to leapfrog in terms of key development indicators. And as I said, I have a lot to say on this topic and I'll share the link to um, some of the work that we've been doing. And of course, this is, this is BIT's mantra, we want to enable payments to empower people. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ms. Jamat. And that link will be shared again at www.oacssdm.com. That's the website where you can all join the movement. Folks, we've come to the end of our session. We know we have lots more to discuss, but again, this was only a teaser. We look forward to seeing and hearing more from you. And please continue to check in because I'm sure there will be other teasers coming up. Thank you so much for the opportunity to moderate the session. And thank you so much to our esteemed panelists for your insights, your perspectives, and definitely the passion within which you presented it. Thank you again. And over to you, Lisa, to bring our session to a close and to remind all of our participants how they can join the movement. Thank you, Marsha. And just to add as well, a special thank you to the Republic Bank. They are the title sponsors for the Sustainable Development Movement 2020, the most innovative bank in the world. They have an ex a powerful team there and they are absolutely engaged as it relates to sustainable development and connected in a very powerful way to the topic of the webinar that looks at business unusual. In fact, it has been a very disruptive 
and engaging discussion. And we realized that persons were fully engaged. We have a full audience even towards the end. And I'd like to encourage you today to take advantage of the 24 hour flash sale that's currently happening right now. If you visit the OECSSDM.com website, you will get 30% of, of the virtual tickets, the virtual VIP ticket that was previously for 250 US dollars is going for $200 now. And the virtual regular ticket that was originally priced at 147 US is available now at 100 US dollars. The team of telemarketers are on standby and they will be communicating with you directly via email. So you can look out for an email from us and from the team at the OECS Commission, thanks for joining us and it was an absolute pleasure serving you today. Thank you.